I'm Ken Rockwell, and this is the Nikon Z 14 to 24 millimeter f 2.8 lens. It's unstabilized. It's for their mirrorless series of full frame cameras. First, let's take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this lens. Like most of Nikon's lenses, they're all sharp. This shot here is shot handheld at 18 millimeters at f 2.8 wide open at a quarter of a second at ISO 200 with minus seven tenths of a stop exposure compensation. And as you can plainly see, even zoomed in here in the corners at f2.8, handheld, it's super sharp. And that's the best you can ask for a lens to do. Now, by zooming in, I'm not zooming the lens. I'm zooming in on the original 45 megapixel file from a Nikon Z7 II, which is the camera on which all of these shots have been shot. Here's another shot. Handheld at 18 millimeters, wide open at f2.8, at 1 8th of a second at ISO 1400, with minus 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. Now this is not showing the lens at its best performance because the camera is all the way up at ISO 1400, which dulls it. But you can see, it's colorful, it's sharp, and it looks just great as far as I'm concerned. Here's another shot at 14 millimeters wide open where the lens is its softest at f2.8, handheld at a 15th of a second with minus 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation at ISO 220, super sharp. Another shot, 14 millimeters at f2.8 at a 15th at ISO 1250. So again, if I had had a tripod, <laughs> the picture would be significantly sharper at minus 7 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. Here's some imitation HDR. This is shot at f2.8 handheld at 24 millimeters at a 25th at auto ISO 1000 with minus 3 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. I used the program called Perfectly Clear to bring up the shadows without the messing with the highlights, so I get the equivalent of HDR handheld just walking down the street, and I'm very happy with these results. This shot is at 24 millimeters at f16 at a 30th of a second at auto ISO 64, minus 3 tenths of a stop exposure compensation. This shot of the Mission San Luis Obispo is at 16 millimeters, wide open at f2.8, handheld at a 15th, at auto ISO 450. And this last colorful shot, and I'll have more shots throughout the review, but this last very colorful shot of these rainbow trees is at 14 millimeters wide open at f2.8, handheld at an eighth of a second at ISO 250. And as you can see, with the stabilization built in the camera, I can be off shooting this lens in the middle of the night, just walking around and having a blast. To have a quick look around the lens, it's offshore to Thailand. It's mostly plastic on the outside, and we'll get to specifics later on. For filters, you can either use gelatin filters and slide them in here. It comes with two hoods. It comes, this thing is just a protector for the front element. It's not a hood. It comes with this baby hood, which doesn't do anything. This is called the HB96. But what's interesting is there's another hood it comes with. It comes with two hoods. It comes with this slightly larger hood, which is not exactly a great hood as far as hoods go, but what it does is it lets us use standard screw-in 112 millimeter filters. Now this filter I just happen to have around with my Tokina 300 millimeter lens, which is a multi-coated 112 millimeter filter with extremely high optical quality, and it can screw into the threads in this plastic hood. Again, the lens pretty much is all plastic, so it doesn't exactly have the precision feel of the Japanese-made lenses of the 1980s, but so what? Those lenses didn't have the optical performance of this. And this is how that filter worked. Now it becomes fairly big. The nice thing is, I'm going to show all this later on, but it doesn't have any significant flare, so the fact that the hood doesn't do anything is not a problem. Now this hood, the normal 82 millimeter cap it comes with, actually, I tricked you, it's not a normal 82 millimeter cap. You see the scalloped edge? This 82 millimeter cap can go into this like this and do that. But here's the deal. If you use this larger hood and use a 112 millimeter filter, this cap can't attach. Nikon includes yet another thing, an LCK104 cap expressly designed for this hood. And this is the standard way I carry this lens. You do want to use a filter because that keeps your fingerprints and crud off the front element. If you don't use a filter, you're asking for trouble. And probably someone who hasn't shot one of these lenses very much in the field and realize you really need to have a filter because this way you can throw the filter away when things get out of line instead of throwing the lens away when it gets hit or scratched. What's new about this lens? Well, it's the first 2.8 ultra-wide zoom for the mirrorless Z cameras. Of course, Nikons are making 14 to 24 millimeter f2.0 lenses for quite a many years. I'll show that later in the comparisons. 
It's also the world's first 14 millimeter f 2.8 lens that can sort of take a screw in front filter with that HB97. It's the first ultra, ultra wide lens with a digital display, which I think is a complete waste of time. It's this thing that only lights up for a few seconds when you press this display button. You can press it just like the 1970s with the Texas Instrument digital watch. Press it a couple of times to get different displays, but it always turns off after a few seconds. So I find it pretty useless. It has a lens function button, which you can program. It usually is for autofocus lock, but you can program it for other things in your camera. What's good about this lens? It's ultra sharp. It's remarkably resistant to flare and ghosts, which I'll show examples later on. It stops all the way down to f22. Some lenses that are f2.8 cheat and only go to 16. It's got a fluorine coating on the front to resist dirt and crud, but guess what? It resists. It does not prevent them from sticking. Nikon claims dirt, dust, and moisture resistance. It does have full-time manual focus override, which most of the Nikon Z lenses have, which is better than any other mirrorless system. Every other mirrorless system requires some menu workarounds that don't work all the time to get manual focus, instant override. But with Nikons, anytime the camera's on and you can look through, which is the only time it would matter, uh, you, anytime you turn this focus ring, you are going to get manual focus. What's bad? Well, it has no in-lens stabilization, and the reality of such is, although the pictures I showed you above work just fine with sensor shift stabilization, if you really want to get picky, sensor shift stabilization doesn't work with ultra-wide lenses in the corners because the geometry of the situation is such that the corners of the sensor would have to move 50% more than the center at 14 millimeters to compensate for the shake everywhere. So ultimately, sensor shift stabilization doesn't work as well in the far corners. So if you're shooting something and it looks like you've got a blurry lens in the corners, although it's sharp in the center, it's not the lens. It's you. It's the fact that the stabilization system in your camera can't possibly make the corner sharp at the same time it corrects for motion in the center of the image. In other words, if you use a tripod, you'll get sharper corners. What's bad is it's got a very limited zoom range. It's only 14 to 24, which is kind of the world's worst at this. Canon's lenses makes a 15 to 35, which is far more useful. Canon just introduced a 14 to 35 f4, which is far more useful. Honestly, when you own this lens, going from 14 to 24, that's a whopping 10 millimeters of difference. And even at these ultra wide focal lengths, it's not that much of a zoom. What's bad is that it's heavy, but what's good is it's not as heavy as you think. In other words, it's not that dent. It's a big lens, but it's not that heavy. Oh, it's bad is it's expensive and even more expensive than the F mount AFS 14 to 24 2.8, which again comes at the end. What's bad is it takes 112 millimeter filters, matter that are regular sized ones. If you're buying this lens in the USA, make absolutely sure you use the links that I provided for you in the description. Buy from a legitimate dealer that I've approved because you need to get this USA warranty card. If you don't have one that says continental United States on it right here up the top, that means the lens uh, is gray market and ignore this if you're outside the United States. If you're inside the United States, you need to get that. Otherwise you have an unwarranted lens and don't know where it came from. So you want to get the real thing. The serial number here should match the serial number in your body or your lens, and then you're good to go. Make sure you get that when you first buy the lens. The instruction book is a big folded sheet with three languages, at least here in the United States. Nikon claims it comes with a case. I claim it doesn't. They call this a case. This is a cloth bag. It's not even padded. A used sock is a better case. Overall, getting to the specifics of performance, it has superb optics, but it's very expensive, and it doesn't have much of a zoom range. It's more plasticky than it should be. To buy this lens for over $2,000, it's got a lot of plastic, and it's offshore to Thailand. It's not even made in Japan. So I would sort of raise an eyebrow buying this. This is not an heirloom-grade lens. I don't see my grandkids fighting over this thing when I'm long gone. It's a throwaway. Use it for a few years. When the warranty expires, ditch it. Honestly, the warranty is only a year now. Nikon got cheap, at least in the United States. There's no more five-year warranties on lenses as they used to be for, I don't know, decades. Now it's one year and Nikon's clear. I don't think that that saved them much money because nothing really breaks between year one and year five. It just makes them look cheap. But Nikon is not exactly doing great financially from what I hear. So that's the way it is. Autofocus is fine, as it always is ultra-wide lenses. Focus breathing. If you're shooting movies with this, which is kind of silly because it's electronic manual focus ring, so it doesn't really respond that quickly, but the image gets somewhat smaller as focused more closely, regardless of the zoom setting. For bokeh, well, it doesn't really matter in a lens this wide because there's never anything out of focus. But if we do take a look at what it can do, here it is at f2.8 at 14 millimeters. I'm zooming in on the final image file. I'm not zooming the lens or moving anything. I'm just zooming in on the file of my video editing software so you can see details. And again, I'm hoping you're watching all these videos, especially the sample image at the beginning, on a real 4K 100-inch OLED TV set. If you're watching it on a mobile screen, they don't even have 4K resolution, so you're missing a lot of what this lens can do. It is far more resolution than you'd ever need for any kind of video format. At 24 millimeters at f2.8, here you go as we zoom in for the bokeh. 
The bokeh is not that good for this lens. In other words, the quality of the out of focus areas is not that soft, but it doesn't really matter because nothing ever really gets that far out of focus with a lens this wide. In terms of distortion, if you leave the distortion compensation on, there's no distortion whatsoever. As you can see at this shot, at 14 millimeters, everything is ultra straight. If you turn off the distortion correction, then go looking for distortion, which is kind of like banging your head against the wall and seeing if it hurts. Yes, it has strong barrel distortion at the 14 millimeter end. There's no visible distortion at all between about 17 to 20 millimeters. And then there's a little bit of pincushion distortion at the 24 millimeter end, which is pretty much what we expect for lenses like this. Ergonomically, it's straightforward. You have a focus ring, you have a zoom ring, and you have this screwy little third free no charge control ring at the back, which I find to be a waste of time because it has no clicks. And normally, by default, it selects the apertures. It's weird selecting apertures without click stops. If I want to go by one stop, I usually go three clicks. But no, now I just have to sort around. It moves things too quickly. So you really have to slow down and see what you're doing. So I actually turn this ring off and I use the camera's control for aperture, which is too bad. The OLED, as I said, is a gimmick because it turns off automatically in a few seconds. I find it to be a waste of time. If we look for fall off with vignette control set to normal on my Z7 Mark II, there's no significant or even visible fall off anywhere, although there might be a little bit at 14 millimeters. Remembering that I'm exaggerating this by showing this against the gray screen and shooting a gray screen so you can see everything with the real image you won't see this. And a little bit of vignetting is good because it keeps your eyes in the center of the picture, not wandering off to the sides. Now again, like bang your head against the wall, if you turn the vignette correction off and then go looking for vignetting, yes, you will see some, which is as we expect in ultra wide lenses. And it doesn't really vary much with focal length and it does go away with stopping down. Lateral color fringes, Nikon's cameras correct automatically for lateral color fringes. So unless you're shooting raw and using non-Nikon software to process that raw data into actual images where there may be no correction, I have never seen any lateral color fringes with this lens shooting as JPEGs, which is as I shoot everything. And as everything you've seen here with my sample images, I get those brilliant sharp images shooting JPEGs, of course. And I'm zooming in here on the fixed image. I'm not zooming the lens. I'm just zooming in on the image so you can see more precisely how sharp it is. For lens corrections, the Z7 II, Z7 VI, Z7, Z6, and Z5, at least I've tried it on, correct any raw of distortion, diffraction, and fall off, and you can turn any of those on or off. All the Nikon cameras made since 2007 correct automatically for lateral color fringes. So you're not going to see lateral colors uh, with any Nikon lens on any camera. And actually, it's fairly smart. It works with any lens even not a Nikon brand lens. Macro performance is silly. It focuses closely, but because it's so wide, it doesn't look that close. Here's at f2.8. Again, zooming in on the image file, it actually is pretty darn sharp. There is some spherical aberration, which lends to a little bit of softness. And remember, there's no depth of field whatsoever in this image. I'm focused on the face and the numbers of this, not the hands. But it's sharp enough. It's actually pretty sharp. It just doesn't get that close. And of course, if we stop down to f8, it gets ultra sharp. It just doesn't get that close. But again, it's just for special effects getting close. If you want to photograph flat objects with this, use a macro lens or use your normal lens. Mechanically, it's a mostly plastic lens. It's not an heirloom. The hoods are all plastic. There's no front bumper for putting this on tables. This front little hoodlet is plastic. The filter threads, there's none on the lens itself. And the HB97 hood has plastic. The bayonet mount for the hood is plastic. The front barrel here is plastic. The focus ring here is rubber covered plastic. This part of the barrel here is plastic. The zoom ring, rubber covered plastic. This part of the barrel with the OLED display is plastic. The <laughs> cover here is plastic, not sapphire. These buttons are kind of nice. These are rubber, as all the Nikon buttons are. They have little click switches underneath and they're rubber, which is good. The thin metal control ring, which I find useless, is made of metal, but sadly, it doesn't really feel that good. The rear barrel exterior, which is really just a vanity shell, this is actually metal. The slide switch is plastic. There is a dust gasket at the mount. The identity is printed around the top front of the lens barrel, right here. It's also engraved and filled with paint on the back of the lens barrel here. The internals seem like a healthy mix of metal and plastic. The mount, solid metal. The serial number is laser engraved into the metal on the bottom of the back of the barrel. And there you go. 
I can't find any day code. It makes mild to moderate clunking and clattering when shaken. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. But let's give it a whirl. Yeah, perfectly normal. Made in Thailand. Peripheral color shifts. A problem throughout the ages with ultra, ultra wide lenses is that the effectiveness of the coatings versus color changes as the angle of incidence changes. If all the light rays come in straight, it's the same. But when you come in from the corner of a lens, like at a 90 degree or 45 degree angle from the corner, lens coatings vary in their effectiveness with color because the thickness of the coating varies as seen from a 45 degree angle. And so what happens typically is the corners get a little more blue, as you can see here. But guess what? You'll never see this in pictures. And this is actually the best ultra wide lens I've seen from Nikon ever in terms of this aspect of performance. So it is pretty good. Spherochromatism is where slightly out of focus backgrounds of foregrounds can take on a slight green or magenta or other colored fringe. I see little to no spherochromatism on this lens, which is okay because honestly, it doesn't focus that close. So no big deal. I mentioned at the top, image stabilization can work okay in the center, but not as well in the corners. I've shown you how sharp the lens is in the corners, but here's a typical example here. Shot at 14 millimeters at f4, handheld in an eighth of a second at auto ISO 360. As I'm zooming into the side, you'll see how it's softer. That's not the lens. That's me, the photographer. That's my body moving and the image stabilization of my Nikon Z7 Mark II not being able to move the sensor in the corners further. 50% further than it does move in the center because it's a solid sensor. It's not made of rubber. If we want to look at sun stars and flare and ghosts, here we go. There really are little to no sun stars. It's large apertures. We're starting to get sun stars at just the smallest apertures, but they're not that strong. If we compare this to Nikon's 14 to 30 millimeter f4, the 14 to 30 millimeter f4 is more dinky. It's much smaller, much lighter. It's much more practical. It takes normal size filters, and it rooms to 30 rather than 24 millimeters. So honestly, if you don't really need f2.8, the f4 lens is a much more sane purchase for anybody. If we want to compare it, I'm promising you this all along. Let's compare it to my 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8 AF-S lens which is this beast here. Now you would use this lens with the FTZ adapter, which makes it a little bit bigger. When you add the adapter, it's going to be bigger. This lens is bigger, heavier, but it's quality made in Japan. It's made with a good deal of metal on it. It feels like a much more sturdy lens because it is. It has no way to use filters on the front or filters on the back. There are third-party kludges, but I don't trust any of them because they're ginormous and there's plenty of room for dirt to get in. The good news is that this lens, which came out in 2007 when I bought it, is just as sharp in practical use as the dedicated mirrorless lens. So depending on your preferences, to buy one of these lenses used or even new, that's a good point. It's less expensive brand new, or you could buy one used. And I have links for all this stuff in my written review and in the description of this video. This is not a bad lens to get if you don't mind carrying a little more. It's got the same speed, same zoom range, same practical sharpness. It's not a bad idea at all. But again, it's still sillier than the 14 to 30 millimeter f4 if you don't really need f2.8. If we compare it to the AF-S 16 to 35 millimeter f4, which works again with the FTZ adapter, it's about the same size and weight as this 14 to 24. 16 to 35 is a much more practical zoom range. In other words, the focal lengths that people use more often for drill photography. It's less than half the price. It takes normal 77 millimeter filters. Honestly, if you already own the 16 to 35 VR, you don't really need to go buy this. If you want to compare it to Canon's RF 15 to 35 millimeter f2.8 LIS, well, the 15 to 35 is a much better lens. It's quality made in Japan. It adds superb optical image stabilization in the lens. It trades the 14 millimeter setting for the 24 to 35 millimeter range. In other words, I would much prefer 15 to 35 than 14 to only 24. It is a real 82 millimeter filter thread. It actually weighs a little bit more. And depending on what month it is, it costs about $200 less. But the Canon lens is not going to work in anything except the Canon mirrorless camera system. So it doesn't really matter. But if you're considering building a system around an ultra wide lens, I would go Canon, especially with Canon just having announced a 14 to 35 millimeter F4 optically image stabilized lens, which is probably the world's greatest practical ultra wide zoom. But that's not what you asked. Recommendations? This is a marvelous lens. If you shoot a lot of ultra wide, if you're shooting in the dark, handheld, as I've showed you, 
It's actually a great lens. It's pretty practical, again, with the larger hood and that big cap. It's not difficult to carry around. I wouldn't want to carry it around on a vacation because it does get clumsy. If you're going on vacation where you're spending most of your time with your family and friends and, and less time shooting, then you want to carry a small camera if you're going on a dedicated photo trip and shooting the camera more than you're just carrying it. This is a dedicated photo trip or dedicated photo shoot lens as opposed to the F4 lens, which makes a much better vacation lens where you spend more time carrying it than shooting it. And that's it. If you've enjoyed this, I'm Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv. The full written review of this lens, I have a link to that where you can actually look at the image files that I've shown to your own content on your own computer and see for real what this lens can do. And I want to thank you very much for watching KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv.